Hello, uh, welcome back to Art Laughs with me, Verity Babs. Today, I spoke to Chloe Petz. Chloe, please introduce yourself. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Chloe, uh, a comedian and the, a, a, an art novice, I would say. It's how, it's how we like them. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me anything and I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> complete misuse of power <laughs> yeah yeah just like i am van gogh or something like that <laughs> yeah i can go with that Ooh, that figures <laughs> <laughs> you have picked a monet for us yeah yeah i've picked a monet um uh so the first time i ever saw this picture pe- picture see i don't even call it the right thing painting was uh when i was in year five i remember really really clearly um we were doing art or something and I was going through all of these postcards and I kind of really didn't like art class because I wasn't very good at it and I was a child that sort of like was a real perfectionist so I needed to Mm. be good at everything and I was going through and I thought like I I had um the water lilies did he do that as well yeah so I had them and um and I was like oh maybe I'll do the water lilies I started I was like this is shit and then I (laughs) It was like, oh, well, I'll just draw these trains. I'll just draw these trains. Oh, I didn't say it's the, the Gar St. Lazar. Is it meant to be, a, is it meant to be a, um, a rhyming title? See, things. if I spoke French, maybe it, maybe it isn't rhyming. That's the problem with French, is you can't trust it to sound like how it you looks. Can't, you cannot trust the French. I've always said it. <laughs> that's, um. <laughs> that's actually the tagline of this show. <laughs> it's Art Laughs with Verity Babs. You can't trust the French. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so glad you uh, you picked up on my uh, my xenophobic roots as a comedian. I'm not I'm not one of the lefties at all. I'm uh, raging xenophobic. Um, so the the Gar Saint Lazare. Yeah, that feels like it's meant to be a pun. Um, yeah. so that's just a fun one from Monet there. But um, so I, I drew these trains and I had no sort of concept of whether I'd done something good or not. I think this is how. Um, when you asked me to come on and do this I think I said to you like I I really don't I'm I'm not super into art in the way that I don't usually find things very visually striking like I it would take a lot for me to be moved by the visual image I'm much more into sort of like words or music or something Mm. like that that is what would move me um so I just drew these trains and I thought I just gave it to my teacher and she said it was great, and they hung it in the local library as part of this sort of <laughs> competition thing. And I oh, went to wow. visit it. I was very proud of my, well, my congratulations. Piece. But I was still looking at it like I, th- I like to me that looks as shit as my water lilies. Like what? What are you seeing? <laughs> Thank you for congratulating for me for my year five achievement, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm still holding on to tightly. <laughs> you know, the thing is, no one ever. It's not like you know, in primary school, if you get a kind of cup or an award and you had to return it to the school so the next year someone else can win it. You've always, you've always had that piece hung in the library. No one can take that away from you. They can't, they can't take it away from me and they won't. You're an exhibited artist. The thing of looking at Monet's trains, obviously when he first did them as well, people would have that opinion of like, they're as shitters as water lives because that's not really what a train looks like, is it? Because at the time, obviously people would be like, this is crazy. What's he doing? Whereas now what, it's become very traditional. Was he not like traditional. really well respected in his time? Yeah. So basically the impressionists were doing this thing where up until that point, all art was very much like, I want this to look as much as like accurate and yeah. normally pretty still. And kind of, you think properly, like properly old portraits and stuff, mm-hmm. very traditional. And the impressionists were all about, making things look like how actual vision works so not everything is in focus so a lot of it's blurry mm. and they do a lot of kind of wilder brush strokes and stuff like that so people would have seen this and been like what's he playing at because it's not how it's kind of like if you hung up a child's drawing yeah now, because he's doing something that they're like this is this is not how it is done so the impressionists were kind of <laughs> bad boys <laughs> But the, then, naughty, the naughty boys of the art world I know, very much so but that's the thing of when we look back at art now from the turn of the 20th century we think that's all like super traditional art 
and Picasso and people like that, you think of that as super traditional, but actually at the time everyone was like, what is he on? That's mad. Is it like quite, quite revolutionary? It is. Yeah, definitely. Um, and also at the time, because trains were still relatively new as well, this would have been a big, yeah. everyone was mad for trains. Yeah. It's like super industrial and like, and now I'm looking at this painting, I'm thinking this is an absolute banger. Like it mm. is so good. Cause it fit you, you kind of like, uh, what you were saying like he captures the movement of like like i guess because it's a train station it's about like movement and stasis like because there's a lot of waiting but there's a lot of then leaving or returning and uh the like the smoke coming out of the train just feels like really sort of like active and you and um like cold it feels like you can feel the temperature of the- this is almost like what smoke feels like to look at rather than what it would look like if you photographed it got that sort of like non-linear plume where mm. like it's obviously sort of being influenced by the wind and it's going on all these crazy ways oh completely and it's like you know when people when they first managed to photograph a horse like how horses actually move looks really weird in comparison to how people would paint horses before which are very elegant and stuff and they take a photograph of a horse and they realize that all the limbs are moving at different times so Monet has sort of taken kind of smoke horses in that he's been like <laughs> movement is, is movement is very like jaggedy and there aren't nice perfect edges to smoke like we've seen before and that kind of thing that's so cool who's that one in the national gallery that does the really good horse is it George Stubbs yeah that's his horse the massive one that's- that's such a good horse that i know that's <laughs> that's the thing about even i think art like that even if you're not into art given what a good accurate horse that is you have to go fair play yeah 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 you, you've done a good one there mate yeah exactly and there's, there's a lot of people who are like i don't i'm not into art but i can appreciate craft yeah you know i can tell that that's taken a long time and that is what a horse looks like whereas they could see something super contemporary and be like that obviously took you half an hour <laughs> it's not that's not what a horse looks like <laughs> i'm not into it and do you know what i think it's so well curated at the national gallery as well that horse because it's like you go in and then you turn right and then you go it's like at the end through all of the doors mm. so it's it's kind of like there and you you come towards it and it it grabs you and it's almost like you drift towards it because you're so like mesmerized by like its magnitude galleries like that are almost sort of church like in a way in terms of you go down the aisles and then there is you know the big altarpiece or the massive horse and you lead towards it i think it's super super interesting as well kind of we started this conversation with you saying you know i'm not sure if i'm particularly easily moved by these pieces but as soon as we started talking about them you know you really it's almost like you started to like it more as we spoke more about it I wonder whether that's the case for a lot of people is that conversations about art, I guess, are not part of normal, um, like small talk. Maybe as soon as there is a kind of way in to talk about it, those th- th- things flow m- more. Yeah, 100%. Um, I, uh, f- about four years ago, I spent a year being one of the young producers at the National Gallery. Um, And it was basically sort of like a pioneer scheme. We were the first lot to um, come together sort of from different areas of the arts to basically like encourage youth access to the gallery. Um, So so their their emphasis was very much on like, you don't have to have a degree in art history. You don't have to know anything about it. We want sort of diverse experiences because we want, that to be reflected on how we're we're trying to get people to access this gallery and we spoke a lot about you know I, i'd gone in with, with a very sort of like uh you walk around the gallery and you think i have to consume a everything and b like all of the historical context of this painting you know who painted it when what's the story behind it blah 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 and they really encouraged us just to like look at paintings without the little card just yeah. take the card away completely and just say, what do you think? What, what's the intersection between this painting and your current experience in this moment? And I found that very freeing and very liberating because, you know, it seems very obvious to, to say it's just cool when someone says there's no right or wrong. Just what, what do you see and what do you feel? 
And yeah, so I think you probably identify that I've got much better at doing that now, uh, kind of like trusting myself, but enjoying what it is that jumps out at me because my perception is as interesting as the next person. Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a, it's a really instinctual thing. There are loads of pieces that you can either like have an immediate reaction to like or not like. And even if you learn loads of extra stuff about it, that doesn't even necessarily change what your instinct is about it. And for some people, they find that the little cards are super useful because they're, that's their way in. Mm-mm. But actually, there is something so freeing about being like, I'm going to discard this sort of fact sheet. It's almost like gatekeeper to knowledge and be like, right, I'm just doing feelings. Because at the end of the day, that's sort of what it's for. Because yeah. I feel like the facts can sometimes make you feel like if you haven't got this from this painting you have failed and a trap door will open beneath you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's quite elitist and gatekeepery, some of the bigger galleries. Do you know, I went to an exhibition, I can't even remember what his name was. It was at the V&A recently. He's a photographer, I think. But anyway, it was sick, basically, because he'd curated it and just went. it went through in sort of like this really interesting way. And I think that, the, like the explanations were all sort of poetry that would like seep into like the sort of structure of the exhibition rather than like here's the art and here's the explanation it felt like it was sort of like aware of the exhibition as like this live thing that people were experiencing yeah I think there's lots of opportunities to do that where it isn't just kind of plain like straight to the point the artist was born at this time and at this point he was traveling to wherever i think that there are more interesting curatorial ways to do that like you say with sort of prompts that aren't facts or there was this exhibition last year by this amazing contemporary artist called jess cochran and what she'd done is she had her paintings that she'd done and next to them had portraits by francis bacon who is like a far more you know far better known art historical painter but by putting those together you got new things out of both pieces Mm -hmm. it's almost by comparing things so I mean yeah if you took this painting by Monet and rather than explaining what the impressionists were about you just said this was made in this year and then take a painting from 100 years before and say this was made 100 years before just by that comparison you'd be able to kind of work out that industrialization has made these visual changes Mm -hmm. and potentially that's a more engaging way of doing that was your involvement with the national art gallery um kind of coming from the comedy side of the arts no so so i was kind of like um really starting out in comedy at that point Hmm. um and it was it was more just people that were interested in the arts so you sort of had to interview for it etc um but yeah, I think I think that that was probably like an interesting thing that I was able to bring to it because it made me think about how, you know, I yeah, I guess jokes and words could be used to in our enhance visual experiences. Yeah. Has jokes and words always been your kind of what's the word? All I've got is the word trumpet, but I know that that's not the word I mean. <laughs> yeah, but like, it's my trumpet. That's, well, you, but you know what I mean. <laughs> of The thing all... that I like to play loudly. <laughs> the thing that you've learned from a small child. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's your way in to thoughts and things like that, rather than it being a visual way. Yeah, I think so. I think so, definitely. Um it's always been the thing that I've wanted to create. Like I find a satisfaction in like um, putting together the right combination of words. And also like when, when I read like a really satisfying sentence or paragraph in a book like that can really move me and like stop me in my tracks and sort of take my breath away. Um, And so, so I've never sort of like expressed myself visually at all, but it's funny because I'm quite like a, I'm quite like a visual learner I would say like I remember if you showed me sort of a page of notes that were like structured in an interesting way then that would stick in my head um but as I say like I've never been been had an impulse to express myself through the medium of art 
and like things don't really occur to me in images but and I've never really doodled but I've been trying to sort of like encourage myself to doodle recently because because I'm so not naturally gifted at it or don't sort of have a natural impulse to do it I think it's a really cool way to like unlock the creative side of your brain because you're not thinking about quality you're just thinking about like it's nice to just do a doodle and then go what does that look like I can turn that into a monster or something yeah um and so like my notebook is a lot more full with just like I started doing morning pages and mm-hmm. I'd write the three pages and if my arm was getting achy or like I was getting bored at the end I'd just draw a picture and um it's just nice to just feel your pen move across the page in like a in a way that like doesn't amount to anything like it doesn't need to be anything I think that's something that I'm only coming to terms with now of having been out of education for just over a year is that you can do things that no one's going to grade you for and they can be crap <laughs> yeah. and that's all right <laughs> because I really love being good at stuff bloody yeah. love it but yeah creative pursuits that aren't for perfection I think are pretty healthy and I guess that's a big thing people have turned to in lockdowns I I did a tweet two things that jumped to mind I did a tweet and I can't remember the exact wording of it but it seemed to resonate with quite a lot of people which was something like were you a secondary school overachiever who was given to too much positive affirmation for doing well at stuff and now can't live up to that in adulthood or are you normal like it was that kind of vibe and I feel like so many people particularly women um of sort of my age in the circles that I move in will have exactly that thing of just like oh I have to be good at this I have to be the best at this it's compulsory that I'm amazing at this but it's actually really free and I went to these um like uh I don't even know what they were called it was it was basically like alongside therapy they gave me like four sessions where I guess it was just sort of like introducing you to the fundamentals of CBT so you would have like practical sort of like coping mechanisms to go alongside the exploration that you were doing in therapy and the girl that was like um doing these CBT things with me she was so great and one day she just went to me like what do you think the original humans did like how often do you how much work do you think they did in a week and I was like, I don't really know probably like 30 hours 35 hours or something she was like they worked for about 15 hours and then I was like well what do they do the rest of the time she was just like played danced drew things on the walls like we're not meant to work hard we're just meant to sort of like have fun and like be these really creative free beings and that was like a real change in sort of like uh, my head um just sort of being like yeah I'm just gonna do things that make me feel happy and that's such a good thing I think that's gonna stick with me because this idea of kind of working 40 hours a week in order to be able to pay my rent in London so that I have the privilege of being able to work 40 hours a week sort of perpetuating thing yeah so actually so I have the privilege of being able to like do my side hustle for two hours on the weekend <laughs> but ex- exactly that thing of I went through a phase of kind of closing my work laptop and then opening my laptop to do the other things because <laughs> this idea of productivity being your worth whereas actually mm. it'd be great to just have a do a hunt and then have a dance <laughs> yeah just come back and toot my trumpet that's all I want to do all I want to do is toot my trumpet <laughs> I really do think I would suit being a trumpeter I think I would do it with quite a lot of like joy and glee I think it's it's one of those instruments where because you can't really play it quietly you've got to just be <laughs> you just you've just got to kind of you can't be a closet trumpeter <laughs> you've got to be an out and proud trumpeter well that's the thing you were talking about you know people in your in like the circles you move in and these women who are overachievers i've always found that with female comedians which who often have the shared experience of being overachievers at school because deciding that you're going to be a comedian and go in front of people and do whatever even if that's not necessarily revealing you know private elements of your life just to be like i'm going to do that is a very kind of active decision Oh yeah, 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 one hundred percent. And that's probably why there's sort of like a um, an Oxbridge stronghold on the comedy industry because we're all just like, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 100% interesting. And then, well, I guess, I guess quite a lot of people also then privately go back to their rooms and go like, I'm the least funny, uninteresting person yeah. that there ever is. But we have this compulsion to go back out there and try and be interesting again. Well, is that the duality thing of like, I kind of want to do a comedy gig that goes well, but I also want my kind of year 11 English teacher to be there and to give me a good mark at the end. And yeah, because she's not there, how do I know it's gone well? Like the, the, so much of kind of the ego, if you're an overachiever, yeah. is based on your GCSE grades. It's like, I want, I want a GCSE grade just for how well I've done in the day. Yeah, yeah, Every yeah. day. <laughs> Every day. Please, someone mark my day. <laughs> I, I realised recently that um, I only, like, it, it just came to me in such a distilled thought. I was like, oh, I do... I do comedy because I want to impress my dad. Like, how, how fucking sad is that? Like, <laughs> it's what a cliche I am. I just want my dad to like me. And then um, my agent is like a, a middle-aged man who's interested in football and speaks and looks quite a lot like my dad. And I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm just trying to, like, find versions of my dad to impress. <laughs> oh, no. That's the thing. So many times this that little show ends up with the end we've come to we start with a start with an artwork and at the end it's like but really chloe all you're looking for are replacement figures for your for your father and that's <laughs> the end oh cool thanks thanks monet's trains <laughs> surprise you've really helped me out there mate <laughs> chloe, um, thank you so so much for talking to me today could you let us know where the best place is to follow you Oh, thanks, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. And genuinely, it's so nice to like re-engage with that piece of artwork and talk about it with you. Um, my Twitter handle is at Chloe Pets, Papa Echo Tango Tango Sierra. Um, I don't know why I always do that. Um, <laughs> it started as a joke and now I just do it. Follow me on Twitter because all my things are over there and I post about all my um, gigs and that. And it would be nice to see any viewers come and watch me and help me impress my father you can follow chloe in the ways written below as per usual you can follow me at verity babs art on instagram and it'd be great if you'd give us a subscribe and a share and a like etc and i'll see you next time